Warmest of welcomes to this Nesta Talks to event. Thank you for sparing some of your lunchtime to be with us. My name is Celia Hannon. I'm director of the Discovery Hub. We're Nesta's futures team, which means we spend a lot of time thinking about how to work well with uncertainty. Our speaker today is someone who has thought very deeply about that question. But before I introduce her properly, I wanted to share some quick points of housekeeping. You can access closed captions for this event via the LinkedIn live stream. And I want to urge you to join the conversation in the comments box on the right hand of your screen and share questions, reflections throughout. They won't disappear. I will be capturing them. And I promise to make sure we have time at the end for Margaret to respond to you. So we're very lucky to have a relatively intimate audience with today's speaker. I had TED Talks have reached over 12 million people. Margaret Heffernan is a professor of practice at the University of Bath. She was a long time BBC producer before taking on several CEO roles in US media companies. Rather than rehearse her extraordinarily impressive CV though, I want to touch on some of the big ideas she's developed through her different books, because we're gonna keep coming back to those today. In her last book, Uncharted, Margaret grappled with the human urge to contain and control uncertainty. She even had a chapter on pandemic preparedness, which proved airily prescient. In an earlier book, Willful Blindness, she confronts the behaviours and biases which cause humans to avert their gaze from the problems which end up being our very undoing. Now, of course, climate change is perhaps the starkest and most disturbing example of this in action. As much as she interrogates human failings, she also has some highly practical prescriptions for how we can do better. In her book, A Bigger Prize, she sees a way out of society's obsession with competition in the form of more intelligent cooperation and wisdom. Collective intelligence is, of course, a principle we're very interested in here at Nesta. Hopefully, we'll have a chance to get into the kinds of practical actions and strategies she recommends when confronting extreme uncertainty. But before all of that, I think, of course, it's only right that we first acknowledge the crisis which is on everyone's mind. Margaret, the world is just watching in disbelief as the war in Ukraine unfolds. And, and one of the few reference points people have to draw on are the events of the Second World War. I even overheard one commentator saying it's as if the History Channel started broadcasting live. But I know you've cautioned against using historical precedent as a way to anticipate the future and make sense of current events. Why do you think that can be unhelpful? Thanks very much, Julia, and thanks to everybody for joining this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, everybody goes around saying history repeats itself, and in the run-up to this very tragic war, uh, we had lots and lots of references to Munich. What this really is, is a kind of history by analogy, right? We try to understand the, the, the present through analogies with the past. And there are several problems with this. The first, which should certainly give us pause, is professional historians don't buy this at all, right? So that should make you think, okay, so they're in this game full time. What is it that they know that we don't? 
And what they know that we don't is that, you know, time is linear. And we know today things that people in the 1930s did not know. And so the problem with analogy is that we tend to overfit to the analogy. We think that if there are similarities, then the whole thing will work out in the same way. But we are different people in a different time with different knowledge, with different societies, with different weapons. And so we aren't the same people and it's the people who are making the decisions. Um, and you know, you can see many examples in very far history and much more recent history of how analogies have really deeply led us astray. Um, Munich is one, I mean, it's the go-to analogy for almost everything, frankly, from the Korean War to the Vietnam War to the Gulf War to the Iraq War, right? So that's the one everybody knows. But I think much more kind of extraordinary are looking at the analogies that people drew at the beginning of the Arab Spring. President Obama, then President Obama, compared it to the Boston Tea Party, which is kind of extraordinary, but it was this great quest for independence and freedom in the great American mythology that all nations do this. Uh, he also compared various activists during the Arab Spring to Rosa Parks. Uh, one of the difficulties with these analogies also is that people tend to analogize with their own history, even if we're talking about radically different societies and cultures. So Obama compared to American history, then President Medvedev of Russia compared the Arab Spring to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now, if we look at the Arab Spring, so-called, which itself is an analogy with the Prague Spring, right? If we look at that now, we can see it bore no relationship at all to the Boston Tea Party or to Rosa Parks or to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And furthermore, Tunisia wasn't the same as Egypt, which wasn't the same as Libya, which wasn't the same as Syria. So these comfort analogies, because that's what they do. They give us a sense, oh, we know where we are. It's just like these comforting analogies. It isn't just that they're weak, but they blind us to the much deeper, more meaningful investigation that we could, they, that we could have. They would give mm -hmm. us sense of knowledge that is completely faulty. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying, and I would never say, we can't learn a lot from history. Of course we can. And, you know, we would do better to read things like the memoirs of Robert McNamara talking about how we got Vietnam, how he in particular got Vietnam so spectacularly wrong than to reach for this comforting stuff. But I think the mm -hmm. most important thing is to learn from really tremendous historians like Margaret Macmillan and Roy Foster, who are trying to write history as if the people making it didn't know what happened next, because it is in their footsteps that we stand today. Now, as you say, con conflict is in and, and kind of civil mobilizations is inherently complex, it's unpredictable. And it's therefore probably no coincidence that modern futures practice has its roots in the military. Many people will know it was after the Second World War that scenario planning was pioneered by the RAND Corporation and uh, also the American military. I know you've looked at how various military leaders manage complexity and grapple with tools like scenarios. Can you tell us a, a bit about that and why, why it can be useful in these, these kind of peak moments of crisis. Yeah. Um, scenario planners are, are really fascinating, and um, at least for the ways in which they're understood as much as for their usefulness. Um, every person I've talked to in the military, almost the first thing they say when you talk about this subject is, you know, no plan survives the first encounter with battle. So the point about scenario planning isn't really planning as we think of it. In reality, it's a more imaginative exercise. It's really a way of developing hypotheses which allow us to see possibilities we would not otherwise see. So, for example, as it was developed within Shell by Pierre Wack in the 1970s as a business planning tool, the idea was that you would put a hypothesis and decide 
if that were hypothesis were true, what would you do? And those potential actions become possibilities you probably would never have thought of otherwise. And the classic example of this is, um, is WAC asking the question in the middle of the OPEC crisis, what if the price of oil fell? Everybody thought, well, this is just a lunatic French intellectual, right? Well, well you know, asking a completely stupid batch with impractical philosophical question. But actually they persevered and they said, okay, so if this thing that's never going to happen were to happen and the price of oil fell, then we would do the following things. And then they looked at those following things and said, you know what? Those are really good things to do regardless. Let's mm -hmm. do them anyway. It'll just make us a stronger, more effective business. And of course, then when the oil price did fall, pretty much all of Shell's uh, competitors were really caught in surprise. And Shell, Shell was sitting there really in the catbird seat. And it's pretty much the moment at which it becomes a really prominent player in the global energy industry. Um, there are a lot of very interesting scenarios around at the moment, not specific to Ukraine, but in terms of um, you know, given the breakthroughs in energy technologies that we are, we might be able to make, what happens if we start thinking of the world as a place where there's plenty of everything instead of dominated by the idea of scarcity. Now, all Western economic thinking is based on the idea of scarcity and competitiveness. So what happens if there is in fact plenty of everything? I've worked with executives who are so shell-shocked by the idea they literally could not think about it. Mm -hmm. But I've also worked alongside others, you know, for whom this is a deeply galvanizing thought and all kinds of products, goods, services, ways of working emerge that they probably would never get to otherwise. Now, that doesn't mean it's just a kind of fun and game for the corporate suite, you know. This has a lot of really pragmatic application in terms of identifying alliances that are feasible, new ways of thinking that are feasible, new ways of working that are feasible. And, you know, it's not, I think, beyond imagination to think, if only we'd done more scenario planning and thought, well, what would happen if for some reason people had to work from home? Right? Mm -hmm. Instead of being caught, you know, in a crisis and having to scramble, we would have discovered a lot at a slightly, you know, more gentle, kind pace and learned a lot more about how much people actually despise their commute. And we yeah. could have made the workplace a very much healthier, happier place a decade ago. I mean, of course, that, that scenario does probably exist on somebody's shelf somewhere, um, but whether anyone was reading it is another question. Um, now, since 2016, it's, it's essentially felt like we have been living in a perpetual state of crisis, but whether it's the, you know, the pandemic or Brexit, it's all, they've all been kind of reminders of how interconnected we are. Mm -hmm. And the most obvious example of this at the moment is something you just alluded to, which is our dependence on Russian gas and oil. But to your point earlier about, about scenarios, you know, we've known about the precarious nature of that energy supply for years and years. Why has it taken a crisis? Why does it take a crisis for humans to finally sort of grapple with, with these sorts of open secrets? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good and complex question. And it's very much the question that provoked my book, Willful Blindness, which itself was provoked by the uh, finan world financial crisis, because while the original um, kind of alibi was, oh, nobody could have seen this coming. It was a black swan event, completely unknowable. In fact, you know, you can, you can, and I have looked back and see people warning of things, of something similar to a global financial crisis around you know, anywhere between 2003, 2005. So it's not that these things are absolutely, totally invisible. It is a number of things. One is certainly complexity, which is the inability to connect the dots. So the, we, the dots are all there, but you've got one and I've got one and somebody else has another one. And we may not talk to each other. Or we may not even know each other. So we can't see the whole picture. That's certainly a part of it. The mental models that we adopt to assess our environment play heavily into this. 
if you look again at the global financial crisis, you know, when challenged by Congress as to why he didn't see this coming, Alan Greenspan said, well, he had a mental model. Interestingly, he called his mental model an ideology. And he just discovered it had a flaw. You know, his flaw was he thought deregulated markets were the safest. And although there were failures in derivatives, every other year between 1998 and 2008, he thought, well, if they're the safest markets, these are just, you know, meaningless tremors. So we have mental models that tell us what matter. And, um, and we're very attracted to the information that confirms our mental model. And we tend to marginalize and trivialize this stuff that seems at odd with our models. So this is a problem innate to models. And I think Paul Kruger said this brilliantly, you know, when he said, and it's such a kind of casually explosive comment. He said, you know, I sometimes think that maybe the stuff that didn't make it into my models was more important than the stuff that did. <laughs> So, but we can't live without models. So this is in the nature of the beast of complexity, that there are going to be things that we miss. Um, I think also we failed to understand the degree to which our world has shifted profoundly from one where most things were complicated to one where most things are complex and they're not the same. So a complicated environment is one where you can see all the factors in play. You can see cause and effect. Efficiency is really, really effective in these environments. And things do repeat themselves predictably. But in a complex environment, you have almost the inverse of that. So you can't see all the factors at play. Uh, things are changing very fast. So expertise rapidly goes out of date. Efficiency is really unhelpful because it erodes all your margins for, to, for responsiveness. And yet, you know, we have managed everything since the Industrial Revolution in a way that suits complicated environment and environments and mostly failed to make this adaptation and to understand in anything we do, it's really crucial to say, which of these is a complicated process and which is complex? Because if you apply efficiency to a complex environment, you will do yourself harm. This is what happened when both the American government under Trump and the British government under Theresa May and then Boris Johnson shut down pandemic preparedness on the grounds that it was a waste of money. It was never going to happen. Right. Efficiency won their argument. It turned out to be exactly the wrong thing to do. So I think it's really important that we understand this difference. And it's not an it so far, it isn't a basic fundamental part of our thinking. There's also the fact that we take views from others. And I see this in the corporate environment a lot, which is everybody talks a game of a kind about climate, but actually. Privately, two things happen. One thing, uh, you know, say to me, well, I can't afford to adapt to climate because it would make me uncompetitive. So I'm waiting for my competitor to do it. Right. So this is a kind of stalemate. I will if you will. Well, I will if you will. Right. Dead end. And privately, what this leads to is, gee, I really wish the government would bring in regulation because then we have a level playing field. In the meantime, the government doesn't want to do this stuff. So it's waiting for corporations to lead. So this is a mutually assured stalemate on an epic scale. And, and as you say, climate is, is the, you know, the worst, but also the most perfect example of this because it is requiring us to act in advance of the facts and to take a kind of imaginative leap. Um, which is just kind of, you know, runs against human nature because with biases like confirmation bias, we're only looking for evidence which actually confirms our view. We're filtering out the Cassandras and the whistleblowers because they make us feel uncomfortable. Right. What, what do you think we're getting wrong around when it comes to communicating about the climate crisis? And even that word crisis, which in itself is kind of paralyzing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing we got wrong 
uh, was to think that the facts would change people's minds. And we've, you know, we've learned it doesn't, that they don't. And we learned that again in the pandemic. I think the second thing we've learned is scaring people to death doesn't make them act. I think if anything, it makes them pull the covers over their heads. And it's, you know, it's absolutely tragic as somebody, you know, who spent my most of my life in communications in one form or another. The communications failure since we started to understand the climate emergency between then and now is is just it's terrific it's a complete and utter failure so what do we do need to do now i think there are a whole bunch of things we need to do um one is we have to find a way of talking about it i know this is going to sound perverse but that is strangely positive in other words we need to think about what is the world like when we've solved it and it isn't just like today you could argue that it's better than today. Today, more people die of air pollution than cigarette smoking. It would be nice if that weren't true. It would be nice if in London you stepped outside your front door and you breathed clean air. Not true today. It would be nice if the oceans were clean. It would be nice if you could go swimming in rivers safely. It would be great if lots of people weren't surrounded by traffic noise. So there's a huge, huge upside in terms of the biodiversity and the health and the sustainability of a world where climate change has been addressed. I think we have to start talking about that as the vision towards which we wish to move. And the other thing is I think you have to meet people where they are. You cannot walk in, hi, I know everything there is to know about climate change and I'm going to tell you, which I have to say, is what many, many of my students are just dying to do because they're in their 20s, they're really impatient, privately they're pretty scared, and they're very fed up with having to tiptoe around it. So we need some really dynamic, positive language here, not just about the much better world that we could create, but about the responsibility that we all have to do something and do it now because it, this crisis is different from every other crisis we've known. We waited for the pandemic and then we did do an amazing thing. Vaccine stuff was amazing. You know, a working from home shift was amazing. But when, but this one, we have to start yesterday before we really feel it. And I was interested, I tweeted something about climate the other day and the response was, we can't think about this now, we have to think about Ukraine. Well, I'm sorry, we don't have a choice about the crises that we confront. If we wait for peace in Ukraine, it may be too late to fix the crisis. And, and people were worried, weren't they, that the IPCC's report would just kind of be buried under the weight of, of these events. But it, but it was, you know, the most terrifying report yet. And yeah. it gives leaders this choice. They can, they can either go down the road of accelerating decarbonisation efforts, you know, those longer term, longer term kind of investments, or they could look for quick fixes like returning to coal-fired power, you know, and, and dirty power. Do you, you know, you write, I know, in your book about cathedral projects and long-term thinking. Um, what what can we hope for in terms of a sort of visionary leadership that, that has the responsibility to take that long-term view and do, do that kind of, uh, you know, investment over decades? Yeah. Well, I think we have to look at the people who are doing this and doing it pretty well. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that really interests me that I think is a really positive development um, and which is significantly been led by Microsoft um, is in corporations and industries um, is to do with internal carbon pricing and taxing. In other words, if every single thing in your company or organization does it just have a cash price against it, you know, when you order stationery or lunch or an office chair, but it has a carbon tax associated with it, that's going to change the decisions that you make. And it is a fantastically quick, diffused education for everybody. So that mm -hmm. instantly steers decisions in one direction and away from another. I, I mean, and it's really practical and it's doable, and it's why Microsoft expects to get to net zero by 2030. 
Now you could say, oh, but you know, they're not heavy industry. Well, I have to tell you, you know, running huge amounts of, of software and hardware is not a carbon light exercise. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the adoption of internal carbon pricing is really positive. I've seen it in quite a lot of British companies that are working with it. I've seen a lot more acceptance of the idea as a place to start is important. Um, certainly a lot of the CEOs I work with struggle with where does sustainability sit within the org chart? Mm -hmm. And the way carbon pricing addresses that, because it means it sits everywhere. It is just like money. You know, everybody has to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, I also know a lot of organizations that increasingly are giving a lot of support and um, help to carbon champions who are basically leading the way within the organizations. And I see a lot of community activists doing this too. Um, in the villages around me, I'm a parish councillor because I wanted to get involved in this and literally the grassroots. Um, so I think there's quite a lot of action going on. It's not fast enough and it's not joined up enough, but it's better than I saw a year from now, uh, a year ago. Um, yeah. I think it's a real issue though. It's really interesting the way language changes. You know, when I grew up, when I was growing up professionally, uh, people at the top of organizations were called bosses. For some re reason, I don't quite understand. We call them leaders now. It's always made me uncomfortable because you change it into German. It's really uncomfortable. But very few leaders are leading. Right? They're very good at coming up with alibis as to why they can't act on climate. But very few are leading. Paul Pullman was a leader at, in terms of how he set about dealing with the climate crisis at Unilever. Everybody admired him. Almost nobody dared follow him. Now, we are seeing more companies follow him. You know, Patagonia, well, Patagonia was ahead of him. Levi's, um, as I say, Microsoft, but not enough. And I think, you know, I think we need to start make using language more carefully. We have some leaders. We don't have very many. And and Paul talks, doesn't he, about it's not it's not enough to be carbon neutral. He talks about, you know, net positive leadership. Yeah. So the, yeah. the need to be, you know, regenerative, restorative, to actually, you know, contribute, not just yeah. um to detract. Yeah. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Nesta's very own uh, carbon calculator. If you want to know uh, the damage your gas boiler is doing, you can you can go and calculate that on our website, which is something, a, a tool that was made by my colleagues. Um, so we talked earlier about, about this feeling of being in, in perennial crisis. Um, Nesta's former CEO, Jeff Morgan, um, has spoken of the idea that we're in a a sort of crisis of imagination that we just kind of can't come up with the big ideas we can't see our way forward do you recognize that that diagnosis mm. um i wouldn't say there's a lot of big ideas mm -hmm. um there are some very big ideas out of there and some of them are very big bad ideas indeed um i see a lack of big action um but i would agree with him that there is a, a crisis of imagination if we're not overusing the word. Um, I'm very struck at how when, in a lot of the work that I do with senior leadership teams, but also with my university students, how everybody is extremely um, knowledgeable and competent at analyzing problems, very unimaginative in thinking about solutions, uh, very linear in their thinking, very afraid to do kind of really kind of radical discussion and conflict. Uh, mm -hmm. Not comfortable with the idea that, you know, really great ideas are not born that way, right? They start off as scrappy, ugly little runts of things, right? And if you have the nerve to share them with really interesting, energetic, dynamic people, you know, they get beaten up a lot and kind of gradually they turn into something fantastic. But you need the nerve, the courage, and the trust with your colleagues to go through that experience. And this is as true in science as it is in the arts, which is, you know, the modern pieces that we venerate today were not born that way, right? 
they co they go through this really difficult process of change and just as nature does and what we are it seems to be really uncomfortable with now is the give and take the uh, kind of sparking against each other the creative conflict which this process requires in addition, you know, we have an education system that basically brings people up to say, here's the question. There is one right answer. If you know it, you're smart. And if you don't know it, you're stupid. And so everybody's it, educated old generation of second guessers who are fantastic at figuring out what's the answer you want me to give you. But actually what's much more interesting is what are the range of possibilities here? And why might one answer be much better in the long term than this short term? fix mm -hmm. i think so i think all of our focus on science technology educational and math and that's it catastrophe and i'm really happy that post pandemic people's hunger for the arts is really obvious and now it's really vocal which is terrific you need the arts to to encounter uncertainty and the difficulty of understanding where we are but I think also we badly need to develop the emotional and communication skills to endure conflict because that's how you get through the hard stuff to the good stuff. And it's interesting to think of as, you know, are we in a state where we can entertain conflict? And there was this, this window after the pandemic when people were talking about the sort of art of the the possible this this you know these things that have been achieved by government in such a short space of time get, getting rough sleepers off the streets and um i think it was louise casey who talked about the idea that we should have a this would be a good moment for a new beverage report to think about you know what kind of social contract do we need for the future but it, it feels does it not as though that that window is is closing or we haven't quite grabbed hold of that opportunity but you know, perhaps you think it's not too late well, I don't think it's too late. It's interesting to know, you know, what the audience thinks. Um, I think there's something kind of interesting in this, which is, it's as if we come up with an idea and we put it out there, and nobody runs with it within a week, so we give up on it. Right? That's it. That's, yeah. done. That's not how anything meaningful is done. I mean, if you talk to Louise Casey, it's what somebody I have boundless admiration for. It's not like she swanned into Tony Blair's office one day and said, hey, Tony, I've got this idea. This is what we're going to do with rough sleepers. He says, okay, Louise, you just go and do it. She does it case solved. That's not how it happened. I mean, you talk to Louise about how agonizing it is and knowing even where to start is. It's much more difficult than this. So, But what did she do? First of all, she talked to lots and lots of different stakeholders, constituents, whatever you want to call them, and she was relentless. She didn't give up. And every conversation gives you more information, more insight, more understanding of how you have to triangulate all the different forces at work. So the debate and discussion it's not just, are you with me? It's not binary. Mm -hmm. It has to be about mutual education, information, and insight. And everybody mm -hmm. goes away from that different. And I think the really crucial thing is they go away from it thinking differently. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with anybody where they changed their mind in front of me. But I have had lots of conversations or been part of lots of conversations where I've changed my mind afterwards, or other people have, or both. So mm -hmm. the process really matters. You have to do the conflict and not give up. But putting out a press release and tweeting about it and getting a headline for a day or two doesn't achieve anything. You have to be relentless. And I, knowing Louise as I do, I would be very, very surprised if her mm -hmm. idea she's just thrown away. It was just kind of a cocktail party chat, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it didn't fly, so on to the next one. She's a pr pretty relentless person. I wouldn't like to be up against her. And you're a real champion of the value of 
human relationships, of the human mind to creatively respond to challenges. And I think you're also, you know, an increasingly sort of my, my, in the minority in your scepticism about the predictive capabilities of data models. Mm. Um, although it's it's not a new scepticism. Um, there's a there's a futures practitioner decades ago who had a quote that I liked. He said, "There is no such thing as future facts." Um, and you quote, I think, Kathy O'Neill, who says that algorithms are opinions encoded in numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, what, tell us, tell us about that skepticism, and do you think we're ceding a bit too much ground to machines? Yeah, well, I mean, there is no data set in the future, right? So that's the first thing. So what we're doing when we use, and and let me you know be clear about this. I don't think it's useless. I don't think we should just go, you know, back to kind of stabs in the dark. But when you use data to a very significant degree, you're using the data you have about the past to predict the future. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. One is data sets are almost invariably incomplete and they are frequently biased. This is one reason why, you know, although Amazon invested two years of work in it, they couldn't come up with a way of selecting through um, resumes that didn't generate automatically, didn't generate a bias against women, right? They had tons and tons and tons of data, but the data in itself derives from a certain moment in time. And so in some ways, the data itself is the problem. So you have a problem that the data is rarely complete and it's a feature of a moment in time. And that means it contains the biases of the people whom it reflects. Mm -hmm. In addition, you're then looking for things which you think you want in a particular way. So you're overweighting some kinds of data and underweighting others. So that's a value bias, which is unavoidable. And there's a really horrifying, but I think perfect example of this um, in Pennsylvania, where the state, obviously trying to save money, tried to use an algorithm to save, um, to identify children who were going to be at risk. And so it used all of its data and to try to see, okay, of all the people who contact us, you know, which ones are the emergencies? Well, surprise, surprise, the ones who have been through social services a great deal, if they get in touch with social services, they look like they're really at risk. You've got lots of information about them and that you know lots of their very troubled background. But the, the six-month-old, well, there's almost no data on the six-month-old. And if the six-month-old comes from a middle-class white family that never encountered social services because they always dealt with private services, there's no information on them. So if they're out in the cold, that doesn't look risky, right? Yes. So there's a huge there's a huge amount about all the decisions that are being made intrinsic to algorithms, which are, as the wonderful Kathy O'Neill says, opinion. Now, she's also done something really, really helpful because everybody's been talking about how do you audit algorithms. And there's a big problem there because they're deemed trade secrets so nobody's allowed to see how they work, which means you can't even explain them which I think makes mm -hmm. also very much less useful if you can't even explain your own decisions. Um, but what she said is actually just run the algorithm and see who does bad about it. That's going to show That's you. So, for example, so, 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 another beautiful example where um, a hiring algorithm for fast food outlets um, somehow kicks out anybody who has any indication of ever having had a mental illness. Now, this is actually against the law in the United States. You could not do this in an interview. Um, but once you see, okay, that's what it produces, now you know you have a problem. It doesn't matter how you have the problem. You just know you're running a piece of software, which is breaking the law. So we have to be super thoughtful about this. As I say, I'm not saying, you know, get rid of it all. Don't believe that at all. But I am very concerned that, and I, you know, I say this having run tech companies, that it is in the nature of technology, and especially where we are in the tech evolution at the moment, that the decisions being made 
are multidisciplinary decisions. They may have economic aspects, they will have psychological aspects, and they may have ethical consequences. Oh, and by the way, they also have to work from a technology perspective at speed, at a decent cost. Mm -hmm. Now, those different disciplines are complex, and there are very, very few people in the world who have a high level of understanding of all of them. Mm -hmm. And yet in most companies, the decisions are being made by people who have one expertise, which is generally technology. Mm -hmm. That isn't enough. We have to start thinking about how do we deal with these multidisciplinary instruments. So in hospitals, for example, you have an ethics board, right, where you have doctors, but you also have ethicists, and you may also have relatives, and you may also have psychologists mm -hmm. or sociologists. These are complex decisions. They can't be left to technologists just because, oh, God, technology is really hard and we don't understand it. I had talked to a student the other day who's very interested in cognitive computing. He's a wonderful mathematician. That's great. But cognitive computing is about the human mind. Where is his understanding of that going to come from? In theory, you would like his mathematical skill to be as outstanding as his understanding of psychology, but it won't be. But to make good decisions in the cognitive models that he builds, it needs to be. So we have to think much more deeply about how do we staff and how do we assess these products which necessarily involve very, very different ways of thinking. And uh, honestly, this is something that we we think about so much yeah. at Nesta because we we are sort of bringing together these cross disciplinary teams, trying to understand how you know a designer can interface with data scientist, how they can speak about ethics in a common way, and in so many colleagues who are doing really thoughtful work on these these areas because it's it's not enough to say that you know you know th these tools are too challenging we can't roll them out there, there can be benefits there can be social benefits but it needs to be so carefully done and as you say kind of constructed with that interdisciplinary fit focus um and I, you know i really like i'm gonna in a minute going to come to all the comments there's some interesting kind of debates going back and forth um but uh sophie was taken i think by your um your your points about the arts and she talks about the need um we need the arts to encounter uncertainty to help us kind of understand where we are and you take a lot of inspiration from artists don't you um i loved your account of how ibsen mike lee virginia wolf are, are in this kind of mode of constantly noticing and capturing the signals around them uh, in order to make sense of the world and it's it, it's actually very similar to the futures practice of horizon scanning Mm. Um, I'm wondering, you know, again, just returning to this theme of climate, how can artistic practice help kind of plug that imagination gap? And we've spoken, haven't we, about Anab Jane's work and Superflux. Yeah. How, how can they how can they help us? Well, I think the great thing, I mean, I think there are two things. One is I have such respect for artists and I've had the luck of working with many outstanding artists because everything they do is uncertain. So they have found in themselves a capacity not just to cope with it, but to cope with it in an outstandingly creative way, which is you know, why I think we have so much to learn from them. But I think what, thing, you know, what artists like Anna Jane do, they're thinking about how can we give people an experience which motivates better decision-making? So in her case, as I recall, you know, she gave one of her clients who was trying to think through the impact of climate change, a really physical, visceral experience of what the air in his country will smell like in 10 years time. It was completely mind blowing. Um, I would argue, you know, it might be even more mind blowing to give somebody the experience of what fresh air actually tastes and smells like which quite frankly, virtually nobody in England has that experience of. Mm -hmm. 
So, because I think on the whole, you motivate people more towards the positive than the negative, but I don't really care which one you use as long as it works. But I think artists are fantastic at adapting this, both in telling stories, of course, but painting images, giving physical experiences of either where we really are or where we could be going, good or bad. Mm -hmm. There's that brilliant quote, isn't there, which is that um, good, good futures practice disrupts the present, um, yeah. which I, I really, I really like. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to just cheat a bit and weave in a question with one of my questions. So um, we had a question from uh, someone called Sean Connolly. I had to read that twice. Sean Connolly, um, who asked uh, about grassroots approaches for kind of mobilizing people and uh, just kind of leading in on that theme I know that you are really interested in participatory approaches as are we um, mm. and you talk about you know how they're used in organizations how they're used at nation level um, there's the famous example of the post-apartheid scenario planning tell us why this approach speaks to you why you think it's perhaps particularly timely for climate and other challenges that we're facing? Yeah. Well, I think I think two things. I think the great advantage of um, driving change through participation is, first of all, as we well understand, the groups of people know a lot more than individuals working on their own. Mm -hmm. And so when you get groups of people working on problems, you can see more solutions, you can try more things, you can see different perspectives and the solutions you develop take into account a more complex model of, re of reality. That gives you a gigantic advantage because it's felt to be legitimate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has really struck me, you know, working in the corporate sphere is, you know, depending on whose who's research you, you read or believe in, 50 to 80 percent of these big change programs now called transformation program uh fail and there are all kinds of reasons why they fail but mostly they fail when you analyze it because people don't believe in them when you develop a change program or a strategy which everybody's contributed to you don't have to sell it to people because they made it you don't have to because they were there and there's some, been some really good work done. Ed Catmull writes brilliantly about this uh, in talking about um, running Pixar. Uh, Christian Stadler and some of his colleagues have brought out a wonderful book called Open Strategy. But maybe the most epic example is, you know, the almost year-long national conversation in Ireland around reforming the um, abortion law. Now, this was a big public conversation. You had a citizens assembly of 100 people. They did hours and hours and hours of work together face to face. There were a couple mm -hmm. of fundamental requirements, which is all the evidence presented had to be jargon free. And everything mm -hmm. was about either professional expertise or lived experience. So no opinion, no lobbying, no nothing. Lived experience. What's it like? Who's been where? How did it feel? What happened? All every single piece of evidence was made available to the entire country. It was endlessly debated on all media platforms. So this really was a national transparent conversation. The outcome by which by a two thirds majority, the law around abortion was reformed, was obviously disliked by a third of the country. Mm. They regarded the process as legitimate. Now, this is the essence of democracy and it's the essence of good decision making. Not that you're ever going to find a decision that everybody thinks is wonderful, but you find a decision people can live with because the process by which it was achieved was felt to be good. And I even talked to people in Ireland who said, I don't agree with this outcome. And, you know, maybe 20, 25 years from now, everybody will feel differently. But we had debate and it was open and it was fair and it was clear. And I have to live with it. That's the nature of democracy. And I think that is as true in something at that very high national level as it is of grassroots activism, which is if you engage people and they feel they've been listened to and taken seriously, 
They're much more likely to listen to you and take you seriously. And they're much more likely to understand that we all have to make some trade-offs and to live with the decisions that we come to. Uh, and it's interesting, isn't it, though, that um, groups of people, when they're taken on a journey in this way, and there's been, there's been some comments on this in the chat, um, when people are taken on a journey, they often end up in a, in a more radical place. They move mm. over time. And I think on the, the Irish example, I think uh, at the start of the process, it was a kind of it was a fairly similar split to the rest of the population in terms of their views on abortion. Then they moved over time to recommend this referendum. And similarly, the population as a whole also moved over the course of the referendum campaign, having you know listened to debate about it. So I think it's a kind of it's a fundamentally optimistic thing, isn't it, to sort of you know assume that you can spark this conversation and people will people's opinion will evolve. Um, but but equally, I mean, if I can interrupt you for just a second, yeah. I think there's something really interesting here because this idea that if you have the debate, people become more radical comes from Cass Sunstein's book. And I remember reading it and I was, and I kept, and it really stuck in my head. I kept thinking, this just doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel mm -hmm. right. And so I've actually tracked it down and talked to him about it. I mean, there are a couple of things. First of all, he's talking about juries. Juries are very, mm -hmm. very specific settings and they actually don't easily replicate in society. Mm -hmm. But when I talked to him, I said, you know, the implication of what you're saying is that nobody ever really changes their mind. And he laughed in a slightly more hearted embarrassed way. And he said, yeah, well, maybe I was kind of overstating the case. Yeah, you think that's a pretty damaging overstatement. Uh, you know, the truth is people don't change their minds in front of you. One of the advantages of the whole citizens assembly process is it took place over time. People had time to think. They weren't mm -hmm. being bludgeoned into or forced into a perspective. And, you know, it's a very important part of decision making that you give people time for reflection. And our rather bullying culture, certainly in politics, really militates against that. But the truth is, if people really didn't change their minds, we'd still be living in caves by now. Yeah. And the interesting thing about, uh, you know, all those examples of citizens' juries is where they are most effective is when they have a kind of docking point and some legislative kind of responsibility yeah. or scope yeah. and too often they are just performative right which i think was a you know a critique leveled at the the uk climate assembly yeah. no that's absolutely right and there was a kind of critical flaw in that which was there was not going to be any particular outcome it was going to happen and by all accounts quite a lot of good stuff happened but there was nowhere for it to go and I think, you know, what was so smart about the way that the Citizens' Assembly was introduced into Ireland in the first place, where it looked at gay rights, is that it was specifically, it had a very specific legislative connection with the Irish Parliament. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be a little bit more, well, no, a lot more hard-nosed about using these instruments in a really um, pragmatic way. And it's, well... You don't need me to tell you that our democracy needs some updating. Yes. Um, in the so I, I must exercise some discipline and, and bring in some more comments. Um, there has been a really interesting discussion about scrappy ideas, experimentation. You know, Doris was saying, you know, we need we did we need more experimentation, we need to try things yeah. out. And Laurie says, how do you nurture a scrappy idea and protect it from the tyranny of immediate perfection? <laughs> Laurie sounds a little bit scarred there, doesn't he? Um, any any tips as as the optimist you are, Margaret? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing I'd say is, you know, in the whole creative innovation process, you know, the idea is the cheapest thing. And you need a lot of them, and most of them are going to be rubbish. I mean, I spent a good part of this week trying to write an article I've been thinking about for a long time, and I finally decided, you know, Margaret, this is just not an interesting enough idea right now. Right. It's 
you've, you've done the reading, you've done the thinking, you, you know, you've constructed lots of different ways of having a go at this subject that really annoys you. <laughs> but you know what? It's just, forget it, move on. You've got five other things you want to write right now. Move on to the next one. So the first thing I think is, you know, you have to throw your children overboard early because there are other ideas out there. And, it, and generally things aren't wasted. My dead idea is going to end up somewhere at some other point. But you have, it's a real skill to learn. You've gone down a rat, hill, rat hole, back up, go somewhere else. That's the first thing. And then the other thing is I think it's why collaboration is so vital. Because first of all, pe working with people gives you energy. Uh, it'll give you the kind of confidence to keep going. And at the moment that you just think, oh, maybe this is a dead idea, right? somebody will come along and say, well, what about such and such? You may think that's the one ingredient I was missing. Thank you. That Now I've got it. Now it's a package. So I, I think it's, you know, I've talked to lots and lots of writers because, you know, writing is a pretty solitary thing. And they all still talk about being collaborative, both with their readers and with lots of people that they interact with in life. So I think. I think when you're really stuck, go out and have some conversations with people. It's not necessarily what they tell you, but what they're talking about will lead your mind in other directions. But I do think we should, should we're often, and, and I have entrepreneurship students like this, we're often too precious about our ideas. I've probably had 100 ideas for businesses. I've started three. Mm. And this this reminds me of a an exercise we often do for our colleagues internally um, called the bad ideas machine, which um, <laughs> it, it, it intentionally solicits the worst ideas people can think of. And it's funny how many, you know, just the process of throwing some overboard, as you say, can be uh, intensely liberating. Um, so I, I'm going to. I, I think we are uh, quite close to time. I'm going to just uh, collapse two questions, one of my own, one from the chat. So Ed is asking about how how you can um, how we can change the narrative about uh, changing one one's mind being a source of weakness, because mm. I think as you were saying, you know, people are hung out to dry for contradicting themselves, but of yeah. course that you know that's what scientific inquiry is based on the right. idea that you will disprove a theory and then you will be wrong and then you will kind of expand learning so you know yeah. how how do we sort of embed this culturally is a question yeah. and then my yeah. my sort of add on is about um you you talked about looking for inspiration i i'd, I'd love it if you could share with the group if you felt able to talk about what it is that you're inspired to write about next oh god um I, I think the thing, <clears throat> sorry, remind me of the first part of your question. Well, sorry. Ed's question is about changing the narrative about how um, changing your mind is yeah. just a weakness. I think the best way to do it is to give credit to the people who did it. You know, mm. I think every, I think there is something so deeply impressive about somebody who can say, you know, I used to think about this, but Celia really persuaded me that that because it's generous it shows you're a thinker it means you're not trying to take credit for some a new idea you apparently got from somewhere right i think there's and it and it shows that you're open-minded which means more people are going to come to you with good ideas or insight um i mean i think and i mean so what's going on through my going in my head is you know marcus rashford you know why on earth did the government you know, decide to say no to him when it was obvious they were going to say yes to him, right? Mm. I would have, first of all, stop and think. Mm. Just stop and think. We live in a, at a time, I mean, this comes back to, to um, you know, what happens when, the, when my idea doesn't work. We live at a time where I think we're used to really instant results. We want something, we get it. We want something, we get it. We want feedback instantly. Everything in software gives us tries to give us it, it feedback instantly. There are lots of things that actually hugely benefit from time, and it's not just wine, right? Just stop and think. 
okay, what do I really think about this? Am I really sure about this? I mean, I was thinking the other day, for example, when Netflix said it was pulling out of Russia, I was thinking, well, that's a really bad idea. Surely what they should do is, um, you know, make Netflix free to everybody to, you know, to as a sort of counterblast. And then the more I thought about it and I thought about the IP issues and actually how physically you do that, the more I thought, you know, Margaret, I don't think that's actually such a brilliant idea. I think it's a nice concept, but I think practically it doesn't work. So I'm kind of a big fan of before you're going to declare, sleep on it and make sure you really believe this. I mean, I'm quite a slow writer, which annoys me because I'm an impatient person. But I do, I'm partly slow because I have a kind of demon sitting on my shoulder saying, you sure? How do you know? Really? Mm. Um, so that, so I think, I do think it's important to acknowledge changing of mind because it's what the rest of us call growing up. And I think and I, there are I, ways to do it. In terms of what I'm writing next, um, I've just finished um, a radio play, which is a bit of a, well, it's, I've written radio plays before, but I haven't written one for a long time. <clears throat> and it's essentially, um, it's a verbatim drama about the trial of the Shell 7. We tried approximately two and a half years ago for defacing and the Shell building on Waterloo Road and breaking windows. And it is an extraordinary story, which the mainstream media ignored, much to my amazement. Um, and there is no doubt at all that they did it. Um, there's no doubt at all about the damage being done. Um, and I found out about the case really because my daughter was asked to do the social media for it. And she phoned me saying, oh my God, Margaret, you've got, you've got to meet these people. They are extraordinary people and they are extraordinary people. And it is an amazing, amazing story. And I, I have learned so much mm -hmm. about the climate crisis about activism, about what it really takes, and also what it really does to you. Mm -hmm. Take a stand. And I mean, it's probably not, I'd love for the play to be as good as the experience of writing it has been, because right? it has really changed a lot of my thinking. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the thing I'm really excited about. And that goes out, I think, on April the 4th. Well, we will be waiting with bated breath for that because it sounds like it, it brings together so many of the themes that we've been talking about today. Yeah. And I hope everyone who's been listening has a little bit more courage to chisel away at their good ideas and throw their bad ones overboard as well. Uh, it's been really fascinating and also uplifting. Thank you so much, Margaret, for your time. Thank you, everyone who joined us. Well, thank you for your wonderful questions and insight and uh, for knitting it all together so nicely. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.